Il va être pour toi. <rire> We're live? Okay, you are in a you are alive. Okay, hello everyone. How are you? Is the audio and video all fine? Okay. Well, my name is Guilherme Coutinho, and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to participate in this amazing event with Alexandre Pesso and you all. We really like would like to thank Viviana. Hermes and all the people involved with Global Congress for the support. It is a truly, truly honor to be part of such important events uh, in this meeting of academics and advocates working on at the intersection of intellectual property law and the promotion of public interest. Well, especially to present the last session of the event, it is an outstanding responsibility I guess many of you don't know us. We are both Brazilian. I currently live in Florianópolis, Floripa, a beautiful island in the south of Brazil. And Alexandre lives in Curitiba. Before COVID, we would travel and work all over. But for, some, uh, for more than one and a half year, we have been most of the time confined in Zoom, Google Meets, and other similar platforms. So as we are not able to see you, it would be nice to get some feedback on the YouTube chat. We will do the presentation together and make some stops after each topic to check your comments. So don't be shy. We'll be glad to answer all of your questions. As you have already noticed, probably English is not my native language and probably of some of the attendees. So we'll try to speak slowly but I gotta say it requires a lot of effort. So, hey, Alex, would you like to share the, the screen and maybe you could start the presentation. Oh, yeah, I'd just, make... uh, just like to say a few words before we start. Uh, uh, sure. Like my good friend, Guilherme, uh, we are very honored to be a part of Global Congress. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, all the organization in the name of Professor Sean Flynn, who's a very good friend of ours. We were lucky enough to be uh, attending the Global Congress, the last presidential one that was 2018 in Washington, DC. It was such a great event. We had opportunity to meet so many different people from across the globe and make some very good friends down there. This evening, we're gonna address uh, a very important uh, law decision that we had here in Brazil, a lawsuit that we conducted. Uh, but let's go, get down to business, okay? So let's start the presentation. So tonight we're gonna talk about the public interest and its relationship with a right of access to ownership data on music and why that matters. Well, uh, this data is from 2018, but we are pretty confident that this hasn't changed much in the last couple of years. So musicians right now are getting only 12% of the money in the music industry. Uh, that's an obvious distortion because the whole uh, intellectual property system, especially the copyright industry is based supposedly on protecting the creators. But how do you protect the creator of something which makes only 12% of the revenue? And why does that happen? This is a very famous character in Brazil. And he's saying, basically, you know, we get, we get in the, 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 the short end of the straw here. So we try to list here a couple of problems that we perceive, not, not the, just us. This is like industry-wide perceived problem. So first, we have little to no transparency uh, about the origins of artist payouts. That is, you have to just trust about the number of plays you're getting, their location, the original gross payments before fees. If you are a musician, you get some, you know, some reports from your record company or from your distribution company, and you just gotta trust them. You have no way to know if those numbers are correct or if they are uh, you know, embezzling you. Another very big problem that we've, we've identified 
you have incomplete rights ownership data. Uh, that's a big, big issue in the industry. You have people, mostly musicians uh, and creators and singers and songwriters, they have little to no uh, access to the information of what they're getting. They don't have really you know, easy access to their works or their uh, recordings data. Uh, that's mostly kept between the uh, recording companies and publishing companies and the collective management organizations, the CMOs. And right now, I've just told you about the third problems. You have many layers of intermediaries and late payments. So you have like, uh, I had a, a client of mine, I'm an attorney, and he's a musician and his song, he's a Brazilian musician, and his songs were were, you know, uh, uh, making a lot of success in Italy. And the president of his recording company said, in Italy said, okay, we're sending you money through our collective management organization. And it took about some 13 months for the money to get to his bank account. So there's a whole year between him, someone in Italy telling him, oh, I'm sending you money and the money reaching him. You know, so you have somebody in the middle who was using this money for a whole month, a whole year. That's another very big issue. Four, um, that was a misspelling right now, that was not supposed to be editing rights, those are publishing rights. Publishing rights are very complicated and opaque. You have to basically, again, you have to trust your publishing company and you have to just believe when they tell you, okay, we made a deal with whatsoever and they just paid us this amount and this is your share. There's no way for you to control what's going on. And another big problem that we identified is uh, derived content from songs like remixes or artwork from uh, album covers. It's very hard to use because you have ancillary rights intertwined in this and then usually not licenses with the songs so they can't be used. Uh, oh, our friend here, telling us that he also suffers some kind of problems. But according to Brazilian copyright law, all collective management organizations must maintain centralized registries. And those registries must have data regarding authorship and ownership of works and recordings, as well as individual participations in each work and each recording. So that information is supposed to be public. And even more, the, the law, the Brazilian law says that such information, uh, aside from being uh, uh, charged with public interest, access to that information must be made available to the public free of charge and in, in the electronic form. The issue here is when you enter the, the platform for the Brazilian CMOs, uh, which we have here in Brazil, it's called ECAD. ECADnet is the platform where you can access that information. Well, of course, you get to see who wrote what, what song and who performed in each recording. But what you don't get to see is how much from each work or each recording belongs to each party. And that's the crucial information because that's information that allows me to use a work or use a recording and pay the people who must get it. If you don't have that information, you must go through the intermediaries who take the larger part of the chunk here. Uh, so here's a nice graphic for you all. And this is oh. the decision that we, we reach. Guilherme, please, you wanna make a comment? Okay, so I, I think it would nice it would be nice to just to clarify for the foreigners that Brazilian copyright law establishes a single agency to collect royalties from the public performance of music. So the Brazilian Central Office for Collection and Distribution, as Alex said, of music copyrights, ECAD, e -C -A -D, is the responsible not only for author rights in Brazil from the composition, but also neighboring rights or related rights from the sound recording. So in contrast to the United States model, 
even terrestrial broadcast platforms like radio, TV, venues have to pay a CAD for neighboring rights. And we have the single agency. So in some countries, uh, more than one agency collects for the same kind of rights as public performance rights. So in the United States, for example, there are options like, uh, as ASCAP, BMI, CISAC. Instead, in Brazil, there is a monopoly established by law. So that's it. Okay. So uh, we, we've identified this problem during the course of our uh, thesis. So uh, I studied together with Guilherme. We are we took our master's degree together, and then we you know we've been capping parallel studies, both in the same area. And while studying for for my thesis, I launched two lawsuits against two of the major uh, Brazilian uh, CMOs. One is called UBC, which is the Brazilian Union of Composer, and the other is called Abrambos. And they both represent approximately 85% of the Brazilian uh, market share. And well, I asked the judge to say, well, the law says I may have access to such information, but I do not. So uh, it took like four years for this uh, lawsuit to be tried in the Supreme Court of Brazil, the Superior Court of Justice in Brazil. We have two Superior Courts. One deals with constitutional issues and one deals with everything else. And that's the one who issued this ruling. And this ruling really says basically that any interested party pursuing full access to information relating to individual participation in collective musical work and recording. So that information has public interest and the access to that information should be made available free of charge in electronic format. So basically they are upholding the law here. But I had to, you know, I had to sue them to get this information. And I still don't have it. I have the decision, but they appealed this decision. Their appeal was turned down, but they're still, they still have time to give me that info. So the lawsuit keeps going. But the important thing is that we got the ruling. What can we do when you get access to such large amounts of data? Of course, you can study that. You can uh, try to understand uh, who are the economical forces in power here. We have a very big suspicion. Who are those people who, you know, uh, get to say uh, who gets the money in these issues? But basically, that's not we want, what we want to know. We're talking about the future here. We're talking about new possibilities of music use. And that's basically, we're talking about an open registry of data related to works and recordings. We are trying to address the issue of uh, data relating to works and recordings as a commons good. And as such, we are trying to create a commons governance mechanism for the interest parties. If you have an open registry of data, doesn't that, it doesn't mean necessarily that you know, everybody gets to uh, look at everyone else's data or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this. This should be treated as an open data resource, it's a resource necessary for society. The expected effects that we could use for music with open data is basically all the hype that we've been watching right now with NFTs. That is, you can make those registries on blockchains. You could tokenize works and recordings. You could uh, use those tokens under smart contracts so you can have mass individuals, individual licenses with a high degree of enforceability. We could make feasible the direct distribution uh, of royalties through this tokenization. Let's say um, I want to make, for example, a new... Uh, a music store like an open Spotify, where you know I don't need publishers or recording companies or distribution company. I can upload my token of said record, and that token already contains all information of who should be paid when that song is used. It contains all the information on songwriters and performers and producers and everybody else involved, with each individual share already printed on it. 
So when this supposedly P2P Spotify platform gets the money from uh, the public, it gets to pay directly those people with no intermediaries. So we can, we're talking about amplifying the market share for creators. We're talking about amplifying those 12% to a much larger fraction. And there's a, another beneficial issue here is the raw availability of data itself, which supposedly could increase the generativity of the system and creating an environment conducive to innovation and making possible uh, new business models or new uh, ways of using music that we haven't even thought about it yet. Other side effects that we could talk about uh, include the necessary uh, research on what's going to be the role for existing intermediaries. Uh, and we're not just talking about distribution companies or record companies, because those people also are rights holder somewhere along the line. But we're talking about re-examining the role of the global collective management system. Uh, one of the main reasons that we have collective management organizations is in the first place that musicians had no way of controlling how their songs were used. If, like uh, Guilherme says, he made a song in Florianopolis and someone using that song in Cairo or New York, Guilherme has no way of collecting that money if he, has, if he hasn't got people working for him through these intermediaries. And the other uh, main uh, 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 issue here is that we're talking about these collective management organizations. They have the role of cleaning up the registry. They're supposed to make the disambiguation. They're supposed to pay re records and registries and make sure those registries reflect the reality of who are the owners of those songs and those recordings. So those people could benefit immensely from an open data registry. It will make everybody else's life easy. And of course, if you're reducing the chain of intermediaries, you get more money for creators like we said before. So now, what we have is a monopoly. Guilherme, please. If you could, could get back to the, the, the previous card, please. So Johanna asked us, asked us if the decentralization of ECADIA for agency would be the best way of uh, resolving the problems connected to the, the unrevealed values of authors. I guess this card connects that because Open data would help the entities. Blockchain could be a tool used for Ekaji. And I would like also to clarify, for especially for the foreigners, that in Brazil, Ekaji is the only agency that can collect, but it brings together seven civil, uh, seven other civil societies, which members choose to be part of. So all of them work on a non-profit basis in Brazil and UBC and Abrams are the two biggest societies and the ones that have most international reciprocity contracts. So maybe like this, in some kind of way, ECAD is already decentralized because we have seven societies that are part of it, but it brings together, it reunites all the catalog, all the data about uh, the works and the phonograms. So maybe to open up this catalog would help even the, the, the ECAD to collect better and especially to distribute better because we would have all the information to say to ECAD, hey, this work that you are not distributing for some mistake or for some lack of data, I can show you the data, I can complete your data, I can help you out to make the, this distribution. I don't know if Alex uh, agrees with me. Yeah, sure. That's one of the benefits that could, you know, the whole system could benefit from transparency. That's what we're talking about here. And the issue is people have been saying for several years, 
no, I'm sorry, you, it, it's not just it's just not possible to have direct distribution of royalties. Well, it wasn't, but now we have the technology to do that. That's the whole point. Uh, of course, we, the existence the structures uh, don't want that to happen because the thing is, uh, collective management organizations are supposed to work for and on behalf of musicians and creators and artists. But what we see is that mostly they become, the, you know, this whole mammoth organizations. They are very centralized, and it's very hard to get information out of them. Uh, in Brazil, we had, uh, eight years ago, uh, a legislative change which introduced, uh, among other issues, those pieces of legislation that we showed to you a while ago. And because we had like real issues here that got, you know, criminalized and you had Senate hearings about ECAD. So it was a very awkward issue for the whole market. So as we have to, you know, we have to, uh, to, uh, to give it to ECAD because they have been modernizing their efforts. That's true. They have been doing that, but it hasn't been doing enough. We need more, we need more transparency. And we now have the technology to do that. Of course, there are very, very, uh, lots of issues regarding such a move. Uh, it would be like a whole uh, a Herculean effort to put all the legacy music that we have in the world into such a system. But that doesn't mean we can't, you know, have to start somewhere. We bring here, you know, this little game, and you know if people are acquainted with that. But that's something we are watching right now. And any monopoly should not be unregulated. Even more when you're, that's not like the, those guys are withholding information that is not original of their own. Uh, the people who generate the information that are in the collective management organizations database are not the database, are the artists, or the record companies, or the publishing companies. They are the true holders of that info, but it gets centralized between these people, the, the essentially the CMOs. So now we get to talk about uh, something that moves all this, this discussion here towards the whole goal of the Global Congress, which is the public interest. So where does the public interest uh, stands between all of these things that we are discussing and talking about? Well, essentially, uh, you get an immediate return in the public domain side. Because if you have an open data on music, well, the first thing you can do is map musical works and recordings. And you can say, okay, this belongs to X, this belongs to Y, this belongs to Z, but this work we cannot find who does it belong to. So that's an orphan work, okay. So we can start the implementation of a positive public domain. And by positive public domain, we mean that the public domain is usually addressed as something negative. Okay, so there's no copyright in this, so it must be in the public domain. But we have other issues. We have the positive public domain. We'll say this, we cannot find whoever owned this. So we're gonna put this in this open database and ask for people to come and get it. And if nobody shows up, well, then this must be in the public domain. You know, we can start to issue uh, calls for people to start that. And there's something else. Uh, we can also, between, you know, something, music is mostly uh, produced collaboratively. It's very rare to have music produced by one single person. And most of the time when you get uh, registry issues, is because, you know, something uh, misspelled a name or a document number, or there's something information that doesn't add up, or you have two uh, identical records for the same uh, work or the same reporting, but with different rights holder. So there's a conflict. And that those sort of issues could be easily solved if you have a public database with flags on and say, okay, this song is flagged because nobody's getting any money out, that, out of that because nobody knows which information is right. So people, you who are involved in this, what you're gonna do about it, are you, are you gonna fix it in an open and transparent way? And aside from that, this topography of this ex existing cultural assets, 
And so that we can also determine the legal status of those assets because some, that's something we just cannot do right now. We'll make room for the improve the performance of cultural institutions like museums, libraries, collections that could you know, uh, benefit from the preservation and recycling of such content, and especially from a lowering of transaction costs that they have to incur right now in order to determine if they may digitalize an asset or not. Sometimes it just makes them feasible to digitalize a whole uh, collection because you have to go through each work by hand to determine, okay, there's an heir to this, or the company went broke and nobody knows what happened to these guys. And that work just keeps going unused and unused and unused. So a very nice picture of a library. And already drawing to the end of our presentation here, so we can get some time to discuss with people. We are moving the discussion from just simply access to works, which is a very large and important issue, but we think the access to works is embroidered in the larger aspect of the access to data about the works. We're talking about uh, ownership data. We're talking about metadata. We're talking about making those, those sort of uh, information open and accessible. And by open and accessible, like we said before, we're not talking about you know just printing it out and everybody gets to share it and whatever. We're talking about a commons-based resource. And if they're a commons-based resource, we can and we may implement governance to such a system. All the interest party could come together and you know make that happen. We already have lots and lots of different, different initiatives around the globe that are talking about this sort of issue. There are, we have like uh, platforms on blockchain, we have uh, governance systems that are already in place with uh, social networks interjected in them so people can get together and figure out who owns what. Uh, this is an issue that it doesn't necessarily involve just creators because you have large corporations like major recording companies or major publishing companies that would benefit as well from this. Uh, I, I can only imagine what a, a tremendous amount of work it must be to manage a catalog of a major company. It must be something uh, mind blowing. So those companies too could benefit from this, from an open system. Um, if we get to open those sort of resources, we are also talking about the informational resources that have direct interest to society and direct impact on possible models for distribution of protected works. And this could also indirectly, that's another benefit here, uh, affect the capacity of the uh, cultural institutions, like we said before, like libraries and uh, repositories and such. So we try to make you know uh, five years of research into a half an hour of lecture here, but we uh, think this you know uh, this issue is very provocative. We, when this ruling came out, I was invited to speak on some industry events, and people were very shocked to hear about this. People were telling me, "No, I don't want people to know how much money I make from my works," or "Hey." If someone who's a famous composer and you know he's like a bully with his co-authors and he gives like one percent of a song or two percent of the song that they co-wrote together because he's the famous one, then everybody's gonna know that. Well, yeah, everybody's gonna know that. We don't want to know how much a famous uh, writer or or a famous uh, producer makes money. You know, that's his problem. What we are interested as a society and as members of the uh, academia here, we want to make feasible to, uh, so we can achieve new ways of distributing royalties <clears throat> that don't necessarily go to the same uh, large levels of intermediaries that keep 88% of the money out of the pockets of the creators. Guilherme, you want to make a comment? 
So uh, I would, there is other question from Johanna. She's asking about, she's asking about when uh, uh, a music from USA is played, is streamed uh, in Brazil, how is the payment? So, well, as I said before, there are some reciprocity contracts in between the collecting agencies. So uh, an, an American and North American author should get his payment. It may take some more time, as Alex said before, because it may took some months more to the payment uh, to get to so the author can receive the payment. And, but like there is this important difference because like the, the protection of especially neighboring rights in Brazil is broader than the protection in USA. So sometimes uh, it's good for American authors to be affiliated, not only in USA with the reciprocity contracts, but also to get affiliated in the Brazilian collecting societies to receive this, this amount of money that is being collected in Brazil and is probably not getting because it's something that Brazil maybe is not sending to USA. So especially with neighboring rights, there is some difference in the protection in between Brazil and USA. So it's good to, to take care of it. And I don't know if, if Alex have something to well, some more to say we're talking about, this about when we're talking about uh, foreign people getting paid from across the globe, there's just another level of intermediary. So that's even less money that gets to be shared with the artists and creators. I mean, in the actual streaming system, we have something called the value gap. The value gap is basically that if, you know, you write a song and you produce it and you perform in it and you play every possible instrument and you sing, and you do basically all the work with no one else assisting you, the most money you're gonna make out of streaming is like about 50% of everything you generate from the streaming market. And that's definitely not the, the, the rule because like we said before, music is a collective work. So when you get like, you know, uh, I mean, uh, last week I spoke to a very, very famous performer here in Brazil who's already in his 70s or 80s. And he's like a total genius. He's like beloved by audiences. And he was telling me, well, Alex, I'm not getting paid. I'm getting paid like pennies from the streaming and I have millions of views. So we went to analyze what's going on with his case. The thing is, he's not a songwriter. He's not a producer. He's just a performer. So he's making like about 6% of everything that he generates. And people are not listening to him, uh, to his songs, to listen to, uh, you know, his, they don't wanna know who his publishing company is or his recording company is. They're there to listen to him, he's the artist. He is the guy who, who attracts the crowds and he gets paid 6% of the streaming value that he, made, that he makes. Of course, you have other people who are creating with him, the songwriters. Oh, those guys are in a very good position. They're making about 7% of the songs. So that's the issue we are addressing here. Uh, we have to change that situation. And that will not be possible with reproducing the existing uh, deals and structures that we have in the physical world, in the digital realm, which is basically like we, we have right now. The, the internet makes it possible for artists to get in touch directly with their fan base. But the songs don't go to that process. They still, you have to go to a publishing company, a recording company, a distribution company, and a store. So that's four levels of intermediaries right there. So we get like, you know, uh, you have to have a, a publishing company. That publishing company will pick up your um, copyrights and your author rights. And you have to go to a recording company, which will collect your neighbor rights, but you have to, you know, make a deal with those companies. And they're gonna pay you, you know, 70% or 50% or 30%. 
And with recording companies, if you're just a performer, if you get 30% or 32% of everything you make, that's considering, you know, a very good deal. And people are like, oh my, how did you manage to go to such good numbers? Which is absurd if you get to think, because uh, in the pre-internet era, if you went to a recording company and say, okay, I'm a singer and I want to sing songs that people want to hear, and they're going to say, all right, we're going to make you an album, but you're only going to get paid 8% or 10% because we have to print the album and we're going to need uh, to print the covers and we're going to have to label everything and we're going to have to hire trucks to get them to the shops. So they had to incur in physical uh, transfer of goods and merchandise. So it made sense for people. Okay, I understand why are you keeping the lion's share. But in the digital world, that just doesn't make sense. And that's what we see happening day after day after day in the market. So what we're talking about here is a potential game changer for musicians and creators. We're talking about the possibility to make the direct connection with the public through platforms that people can listen to your song and everything they pay to the platform gets distributed to whoever they listen to in real time, directly to the wallets of each people, each person. So you, you can get one work and one recording and you can make a token out of it and say, okay, this percentage goes to the singer, this percentage goes to the guitar player, this is for the drum player, and this percentage for the songwriter. And every time you listen to the song, you know, you, the, that guy gets like a micropayment directly into, to, into his wallet. So that's basically what this whole presentation is about. Guilherme, wanna pitch in? Uh, oh, there is other question from Johanna. Thanks for the, <laughs> 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 for all the support. So she's asking if she, if she has an author decide to sing, record all the instruments without a label uh, and to organize without a publisher, publisher the, the songs. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you may not have a label to, to receive the neighboring rights. You can be your own, uh, the own label, the own producer. But if you don't have a publisher, you won't get the mechanical royalties. That's, that's is a, that is a, something in the actual system that 9% nine, 9 from all the revenues of Spotify and other digital, the, the DSPs, the digital service providers are paid in Brazil to publishers that have the contracts necessary to get the mechanical or the reproduction royalties. So without a publisher, you won't get 9% of the revenues. So you may have the other revenues, but not the, the, the mechanical ones and the reproduction ones. And I guess if you could change the card, we would like to invite you all. Uh, hey, Alex, if you could, could go to the next card. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so next week, we are hosting um, the, the Congress on Copyrights and the Public inter Interest. So it's an online, open, free Congress. It's a real, like, we are hosting it for 15 years with Jedi, the, the group of studies on cop uh, copyrights and intellectual rights, uh, intellectual property here in Brazil. So there will be panels in Portuguese and Spanish and English. Uh, you can check the program on the website, jedi.com.br. So we would be really glad to receive you all on, in this amazing event. And I don't know if you have something more to say, but I guess we would like to, we hope we, you all enjoy the session. You can reach us on the on, on our contacts by email, social media, so we can keep in touch. And if you need a more detailed question or something, just reach us and we will 
would be glad to, to talk with you. So I'd like to thank uh, the Global Congress, uh, especially Professor Sean Flynn, which is a very good friend of ours. Um, and we, you know, uh, Professor Sean Flynn has been down to Brazil a couple of times already, taking part in CODAIP, which is our largest Congress of public interest and intellectual property here in Brazil. It's, our, it's not the global Congress, but the Brazilian Congress of these issues. So we are pretty uh, happy to be uh, part of this group that's been hosting this event for the last 15 years, which is like a really long term in terms of academia and uh, academic events. Uh, like Guilherme says, we like to invite you all to take part. Uh, we also, we always have like, you know, a top level um, discussions here and uh, very uh, cutting edge uh, issues that are going on. So we, like Ilham says, this is here are our social media contacts and we'd be happy to discuss any further issues with any of the audience who are interested. And we hope that we could get the message across what we're discussing right here and why does this matter in relationship to the public interest? So uh, again, we'd like to thank everybody who's been attending us and all the people from the organization of the Global Congress, uh, especially Viviana has been very helpful to us in these past weeks with arranging this meeting. And well, thank you everybody. If anybody else has something to say, Hermes people, Okay, so that's it then. Thank you very much. We're gonna uh, stop the recording, so. All right. Anybody from the, from the organization wants to say something? Okay, so that's it then. <laughs> All right, people, so we managed to do that in a little uh, further than 45 minutes, so we're getting good at this, Guilherme. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all, and I hope to see you presentially soon, because, well, Zoom is good, is, is, is a, a good platform to connect us, but I guess to, uh, uh, it would be better to see you all live, make some hugs and etc. So thanks a lot, and I hope to see you on, the, on our other event next week, starting on Wednesday, the Congress on Copyrights in Intellectual Property, okay? Thanks, Alex. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you very much. See you next time.